Good afternoon, everyone. With the FY22 um, budget process uh, now underway, I was uh, hoping to use today's briefing to provide an overview of um, our budget proposal and to outline the process that we're going to go through between now and the middle to end of June to um, finalize uh, the budget and to invite members of the community to provide feedback um, on the, the current draft that we've been starting to work with with the city council. Um, here's a summary of the ways in which um, we are inviting people to um, give feedback. Uh, we gave a first um, presentation to the Board of Finance of the FY22 budget and overview this past Monday. And um, that was the first of um, numerous meetings between now and mid-June that the that will be public meetings that the invite the public's invited to attend and um, give feedback at, at the public forum. Um, the next opportunity for that is this coming Monday, May 10th. In addition, um, we will be sending out today a, uh, a survey um, and there's the link for it right there. We'll also be emailing that out and sending that out through Front Porch Forum. And um, uh, there is more information um, about this, and about the budget on a new webpage um, that is at the, the link up, up there on the screen. And uh, we uh, maybe at the end also we'll, we'll swing back to this um, uh, so that uh, people can see this again. But um, we um, all this is you know, really to make good on one of the goals we have for this budget process is for it to be a collaborative one that produces a budget representing a broad consensus. Uh, this is um, an exciting budget year. It also is, is a challenging year. It's a very different challenge than last year. Last year, we faced a dramatic reduction in the revenues that forced us to eliminate virtually all discretionary spending in our municipal budget to stop the advancement of almost all non-COVID new initiatives. There are a couple exceptions to that, but many initiatives came to a stop. And we also had to spend down significantly um, emergency reserves that we had spent years building. We kind of think of this as a rainy day fund. 2020, um, the pandemic was uh, really an unprecedented storm. Um, this year, uh, we have a very different situation. We have an infusion of $27 million uh, of federal um, American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Sometimes we're going to refer to that in this presentation as ARPA. Um, and uh, we also have a, an economy that is starting to bounce back um, uh, and bringing in revenues to the city once again. Um, uh, but it is, uh, it is still going to be significantly below pre you know, kind of pre pandemic projections. So this creates a complex and an exciting challenge. Um, we, with this budget, we must restore full city operations, make structural progress on strategic priorities, and really carefully steward this unprecedented infusion of one-time resources. These one-time resources, this $27 million, we have until the end of 2024 to, to invest. And we are, um, at, we, and when I say we here, this is, I know, a goal of the city councils as well. Um, we are going to set aside a significant portion of that 27 million. We think will be 10 to $15 million of that 27 million um, that will be uh, where decisions for those dollars will be made through a deliberative process that will include a series of public conversations this summer um, and uh, we are gonna have conversations around climate action, equity initiatives, and other long-term community investments. And that will be a separate um, iterative uh, engagement process culminating sometime um, in, in the fall for where we will be making decisions about that 10 to $15 million. And we'll be talking much more about that, the process for that in the months ahead. Um, will be assisted in, in kind of really laying out how that's going to work once the federal government issues definitive rules regarding ARPA, um, which is expected by May 10th, um, so soon, within, by the, you know, basically by next week. 
And once we see um, what decisions the state government makes about how those emergency dollars are, uh, that the, the state controls are being invested. Today's presentation, today's discussion um, is about the FY22 bu budget, because it is clear that we are also going to need to use significant amounts of our ARPA funds um, to have a full service FY22 budget without major tax increases. Um, and that was one of the intents of the ARPA legislation. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. Um, again, in order to do that, we, we uh, in order to get this right, both of these, right, both the FY22 budget and the later effort, we uh, are wanting it, uh, as much public input as possible and, um, uh, uh, and, and seeking that in part with today's presentation. So here, what Samantha has up on the screen are the um, principles that we laid out for this FY22 budget um, with the city council and the board of finance on Monday. Um, I'll go, I'll try to go through each of them quickly. The, the first principle is that all city services will be restored to pre-pandemic levels. The hiring and wage freezes that we implemented early in the pandemic um, are, are, have been lifted now and will, will not be reimposed for the upcoming budget year. And discretionary spending on non-personnel items like training and events and uh, professional con consulting, um, those budget lines are, are being reviewed, but they are basically being fully restored. Um, we are looking for opportunities for, for long-term savings where we've learned something in the pandemic, but we are also uh, re restoring that important level of investment. Um, the second principle is um, invest. We are proposing that we keep investing in critical infrastructure at um, pre pandemic levels, and that this enhanced level of spending uh, over what we had done historically is needed to address our aging assets and to advance our net zero energy city goals. So to say just a little bit more about this principle, what are we talking about here? You know, for the last five years, we have tripled the historic amount of annual investment in our sidewalk infrastructure. Uh, we have been for the first time ever making uh, relining efforts in our miles and miles of, of um, water su supply um, infrastructure. Uh, this, um, we had planned to go back to the voters last year, last fall, and to um, ask for another installment of the sustainable infrastructure bonding that we did from 2016 in, until now, because we have fully spent down that bond. Because of the pandemic, those plans were uh, delayed um, by a year, it was not possible to move forward with them. And so if we wanna continue this enhanced level of invest investment um, uh, that is critical to um, providing alternative transportation um, to cars and to really uh, addressing these areas of chronic underinvestment, um, we will need to use uh, federal funds if we want to not lose the uh, current um, construction season, the current construction year. Principle number three, um, we um, are proposing restoring our emergency reserves to address future um, uh, economic uncertainty um, and new um, uh, emergencies, new surprises, new disasters. Um, we are proposing to do this within the context of our um, uh, unassigned fund balance, basically the, the policy that we have for these reserves. We're recommending, we're proposing that we fund at the upper um, end of the reserve amount have to set aside 15% of our uh, uh, general fund on an annual basis so that if the recovery out of this recession takes longer than we are currently hoping or if something new happens, we have the resources to address that. So um, uh, by way of example, 15% um, is about $9 million on the general fund budget and we are Beneath that, by about a million dollars now, we we're proposing restoring a uh, million dollars. Um, we had spent down much more than $1 million over the last year, but we were um, at historically high levels for a variety of reasons we get into, but um, 
Uh, that's what's, those are the numbers entailed there. The next principle, tax increases should be minimized as much as possible. Um, here's how we're making good on that principle. We, um, even though our costs are going up and have continued to uh, escalate each year because of the nature of our contractual agreements and inflation, um, we did not seek and are not planning on seeking for the current fiscal year uh, new uh, taxing authority from the voters. Um, we are planning, or at least we have proposed to the city council that we implement the public safety tax that was approved by voters in the spring of, in March of 2020, um, in which we chose uh, because of the pandemic to defer last year um, because the, the, the new ambulance service is in this budget, um, and that is a significant structural change to this budget, uh, we are um, feeling the need to implement that voter approved increase um, in this budget season. We are not, however, proposing to put in place the new affordable housing tax, the new housing trust fund tax that was approved by the voters in the legislature over the last year. We are proposing deferring that for a year because we think we can do that uniquely in this year without impacting the efforts to generate more affordable housing uh, opportunities because of the huge and unprecedented levels of affordable housing uh, resources that are coming down from the federal and the state government uh, over the next year. We have consulted closely with Champlain Housing Trust in making this decision and, and they support it. So that, uh, that, that, that is another way, in addition to not asking for new authority, that we are, are trying to make good on this principle of minimizing tax increases. Um, we see that as an important principle really for two reasons. While there thankfully are many members and businesses, many members of our community and many businesses that are doing very well right now that have even thrived in this um, uh, pandemic, there, it, it has been a very uneven pandemic. And there are many households that are, have very much been economically impacted. And there are many businesses that have, are, are just holding on as we come out of this recession and we want to minimize any new uh, tax, um, tax burden. The um, next principle, the city will make overdue investments in racial equity and justice in language access and livable wages. Later down in the presentation, we have a little bit more detail on that. And um, uh, the final one on this page, the municipal city enterprise funds severely impacted by the pandemic may require support. There we're specifically speaking about our parking uh, operations as well as our uh, electric and water utilities, all of which have seen their revenues hit dramatically um, by the uh, pandemic and who are eligible for um, support under the ARPA uh, legislation and who are really have gotten um, very little, almost no relief. Um, unlike almost all other businesses, they have gotten uh, very uh, little relief up until now. We may uh, need to help um, help them um, uh, uh, to to get through this period. And then the final um, principle, which I think is on the next slide, um, we are going to need to use and this sort of uh, significant amount. I sorry, I guess it's the last one here. Use significant ARPA funds will be necessary to make good on all of the uh, other principles um, listed above. So that's the big picture. I am now um, would like to invite our Chief Administrative Officer, Catherine Shad, who this is her second budget year. She has um, really uh, managed to start her uh, career with the city with the two most unique budget years, probably in the last uh, century, um, and really appreciate the, uh, the, the hard work and um, uh, commitment she's brought to the process already. And I want to hand this over now to Catherine to um, walk through some, some of these points in greater detail. Go ahead, Catherine. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, it has certainly been an interesting time to join the city, um, but I have been pleased to be a part of um, the team trying to figure out these unprecedented budgets. 
Um, as you can see here, um, this table is um, some changes um, in the operating budget where we show what we expect to still be significantly impacted in terms of revenues um, in next year's budget. As the mayor said, um, there were a lot of um, various impacts over this past year. Um, many of them we are seeing getting better. Um, and in fact, all of these have shown improvement um, we are expecting between FY21 and FY22, um, but there are still large impacts. Um, just to point out the methodology on this slide, um, we did use FY20 as our year of comparison uh, because as the mayor pointed out, FY21 was a lean budget. So as we determined what we thought expenses would be, what we expected them to be, we started with that FY20 budget and we applied a 2.5% level of escalation. You can see that in the FY20 plus one year inflation column. And then uh, we did the same thing to get to FY22. Then where the difference is, um, you will see all in red. Um, then in the next table, um, you will see um, that we have increases in general fund expenses. And these are areas where we are choosing to make increased investments. Um, over where uh, we would have expected. And the same methodology was used um, starting with the FY20 budget and again, um, applying inflation or a rate of escalation over what we might expect. Um, in this column, uh, sorry, in this table, you can also see a column for one-time costs. Um, and for uh, the racial justice fund, um, you can see, uh, for instance, the racial justice fund is going to um, cover some of the costs for REIB, um, our racial equity, inclusion and belonging department. Um, and those are one-time costs to train all of the city. Um, so that $1.8 million, they are not all ongoing costs. Um, as the mayor mentioned, the fire department has ongoing costs um, because of the fire department and some of these others um, we'll continue to talk about in terms of um, new initiatives as well. We mentioned um, capital budget needs and the mayor talked about um, the fact that we are pretty much out of the sustainable infrastructure bond. Um, to put a fine point on that, we have just under $115,000, um, which isn't gonna get us very far um, when you see um, the investments um, that we would like to make to keep um, investing at the level um, that our citizens have become accustomed to. You can see on the notes section um, what's included there and we'd be happy to answer questions about that. Um, but it is largely streets and sidewalks, stabilizing facilities where that needs to be made, um, some waste water and water investments, and then finishing the bike path, um, which will be very exciting for everyone. We know that's um, seen even more increased usage during COVID. So that is um, a top priority for us. Um, as the mayor mentioned, um, our enterprise funds um, were hit um, very hard. Um, and there's actually a couple of last minute changes to this slide. So I'm just gonna talk through them um, with you and we could get you an updated slide deck. Um, traffic and parking funds um, is, um, this is correct. We are seeking a um, million dollars for operational solvency and some capital improvements. And that is because 
Um, as you probably know, there were about three months at the beginning of the pandemic where um, we received virtually no parking revenues. Um, and those revenues have been down um, significantly ever since, and they haven't bounced back. We're optimistic, um, but that's been um, a large, a large gap. Um, the Burlington Electric Department, um, we had originally in Monday's uh, Board of Finance meeting um, asked for this 600,000 in arrearage assistance for customers. Um, what this means in plain language is this would simply be providing grants to customers who have been unable to pay their electric bills. And we would wipe this money um, clean before the time comes when we have to go back to uh, suspending or disconnecting service. So really give everyone a chance to start from a level playing field. Um, after uh, further conversations with city council, um, what you see on the very bottom slide where we had considered um, some revenue replacement up to $2.1 million, um, Upon further discussion, um, up until this morning, um, very late, which I think is why this slide isn't updated, um, General Manager Springer um, and the mayor and I have decided we're not going to ask for that. Um, but instead, the 600,000 in arrearage assistance was actually only half of what uh, the total arrearages are, which is 1.3 million. So we will be asking for up to 1.3 million for arrearage for Burlington Electric. Um, for Burlington, for the water resources, um, it is 475,000 in arrearages and it's the same kind of grant program um, as BED. And then um, to be discussed later um, would be possible revenue replacement and that would just be for water and wastewater again. Um, I am pleased um, to say that although we do have decreased resources um, in some of those areas uh, I showed you earlier um, in terms of parks revenues and gross receipts, we do also have um, additional revenues. Um, the mayor mentioned the increased public safety tax. Um, and we expect that to contribute about $1.2 million to the general fund. Um, we do have 432,000 left in the racial justice fund. That was from the original $1 million allocation from last year. And that's largely because it takes a while to staff up a department and really spend the money. Um, and so now that they have really found um, their stride and we're really ramping up, they can certainly use that money this year. And as we mentioned, we are expecting $27 million in total in ARPA funds. Um, we are not getting that money in one big check, um, but we are expecting uh, the first installment of that next week along with the guidelines from the treasury, as the mayor said. Um, some of the restored initiatives uh, that we uh, are pleased to announce in this budget, we are calling it a full service budget compared to our lean budget last year. Uh, we are able to bring seasonal employees back to the pre-pandemic level, and that helps with a lot of quality of life issues that citizens notice. It's increased snow plowing, lawn um, lawn care, uh, lawn mowing and graffiti removal, things like that. Um, and we are also able to um, thaw our staffing freeze, as I like to say, um, and rehire for critical positions around the city and add new positions as needed. Um, the city council, um, in addition, um, to uh, their meager funds um, for uh, and able to do their job, they this year only had $10,000 um, for any initiatives that they wanted to do. And that was really limiting. 
Um, so this year we will bring that fund back up to 100,000, which is where it has traditionally been. Um, uh, also the early learning initiative, um, we recognize um, that this is a huge priority across the country and it is in the city as well. Um, early childhood education is critical. So we will put this back to uh, the level it was pre-pandemic. And we are all looking forward to getting back to community festivals and events like July 3rd, Festival of Fools and various kinds of um, arts and other festivals the city supports. So those are all back in the budget as well. Um, new and expanded programs um, include um, staffing for city council committees. Um, this is a um, really an equality issue um, that was brought to us by um, the REIB. And I see that I am now turning this back over to Moreau. I'm really just on a roll. So Mayor, why don't I turn it back over to you so you can keep going? Sorry about that. I'm so excited about all of our budget initiatives. Uh, and we appreciate your excitement. Um, great. Yeah, why don't you stay on here too? I mean, we can do this together. Um, you know, touching qu quickly on each of these bullets, uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the things we were um, struggled to do uh, during pandemic times with a hiring freeze and reduced city staffing is um, uh, properly support all of the, uh, not just city council committees, but other ad hoc committees, other committees have been created to advance initiatives um, that uh, takes real effort and real uh, investment. And, and that is back in this budget. As mentioned before, this will be the first full year of operations of the third ambulance stationed in the new North End. Um, with um, warming temperatures, um, uh, there in many uh, frequent in recent years, we have had our um, demand for public restrooms uh, for a longer season, both in the spring and the fall, than um, in, in the parks in particular, uh, than we uh, have traditionally planned for and funded. We're addressing that in this budget, having an expanded season. Um, on both uh, both sides of the year, both sides of the summer. And um, we, as we have had for the last year during the pandemic, where we have expanded the responsibilities of uh, Cara al Rawi, our Church Street Marketplace Director, to um, be uh, supporting all uh, uh, of the downtown and Burlington businesses through, um, through the pandemic, we are going to continue that for another year um, uh, as we are trying to support um, uh, support our, 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 our businesses through this period of economic um, recovery. And um, Cara, thank you for, for joining us. Why don't we, why don't you take it from here? Do you want to hit some of the highlights of how you are seeing this unfold over the next um, next year? Yeah, so um, obviously we're we're closely tracking what's coming down from uh, Montpelier and um, some of the further opportunities that might be available to us through um, the ARPA um, <clears throat> legislation that's coming down. Um, and then we're hoping to do a gap analysis and make sure that as we communicate with the public and, and hear more about what they're looking for. We also make sure that we fill gaps to ensure that our business community, um, especially our small locally owned businesses, will be able to get some of the support they need to um, continue to operate. In some instances, some of our businesses need a little support to reopen. They've been unable to at this point. It takes a little capital to um, make some initial investments to open your doors again. And we're working with all city departments to um, look forward and see how best we can use these funds for the entire community. So we'll have more discussion about the economic recovery and really the reopening of the, the downtown and waterfront this coming Monday. There, um, there will be a decision in front of the council for Monday for kind of a, 
subset of um, immediate expenses um, that, so this really we're proposed, there's kind of three, if the members of the media there start following along, kind of simple way to think of it, we're, we're, we're seeing three significant decision points um, in the coming months uh, around important financial decisions. The first uh, this decision point is this coming Monday where we are because we have basically run out of the emergency funds that kept our public health response and our uh, enhanced constituent service and business support responses going during the, the first year of this emergency. Um, uh, those funds are almost, that we have authority for are almost all expended. Um, we're proposing an approximately $1 million additional infusion um, of funds uh, using these federal ARPA dollars, about 5% of the overall uh, 27 million, less than 5%. Um, we are, um, uh, that, that, that is coming. There's been one discussion with the Board of Finance about this already. A decision is expected this coming Monday. Then there's a, a substantially larger, um, uh, dis, you know, then we have the budget season that we're talking about today, the FY22 budget that has to be determined between now and the end of June, um, where we are um, proposing to use uh, approximately half of the total ARPA funds. And then there is this additional um, period of time through the summer into the fall where we expect to be engaging the public and, and making some further decisions about how to use these um, uh, one-time federal funds. So let's keep going here, uh, Samantha. I think we're almost through the PowerPoint. The um, uh, Back now on the FY22 budget, some additional new and expanded equity initiatives that are, are part of the proposed budget we discussed with the council Monday include a significant expansion of the racial equity inclusion and belonging department. As I committed to in my state of the city, we are looking to build on the momentum that that department has created in its first year of existence and um, uh, address some key additional needs. So we will be adding an equal opportunity specialist, a racial equity data analyst. So much of the um, work we are trying to do to um, fight, uh, to, to kind of root out institutional racism, to address racial disparities is, our, uh, is uh, grounded in um, data and a focus on eliminating disparities that a data analyst specifically devoted to this is uh, critical if we're really going to make good on our um, declaration of, of racism being a public health emergency. Um, and we are proposing also adding an anti-racism curriculum manager that will um, uh, manage these temporary positions of um, uh, up to eight um, uh, curriculum facilitators who will be leading um, this uh, anti-racism training for all city staff over the first year. After that first that 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 first year, um, the training needs and ensuing new years are significantly less. Um, but the anti-racism uh, curriculum manager would be a permanent position. Um, in addition, not new positions, but it will, um, it is a shift that is worth mentioning here. The city has created two new public health positions over the last year to address the racism as a public health emergency. Those positions currently exist in the city's innovation department. Um, after several months of operating um, with this new capacity, we are now planning to shift those positions into REIB as well. So all told, the REIB department is going to have been, which was just one person at the time of the state of the city uh, in 2020, that was Taisha Green's first day. Um, uh, this budget, this proposed budget would have the department growing to, to uh, a team of eight. Um, another proposal in this draft budget is um, to um, uh, pay all city workers a um, livable wage going forward. That is, we have um, in many, for the way the livable wage ordinance is written, which is something 
you know, that was um, uh, created, uh, I believe about 15 years ago, um, there were some exceptions in that ordinance. Um, and I think maybe, maybe more like 20 years ago, there were some exceptions in the way that ordinance was written so that uh, temporary and seasonal city employees uh, were not um, required or uh, kind of eligible to, for the protections um, under the livable wage ordinance. Uh, in my um, first year as mayor, we did a significant um, uh, revision of the livable wage ordinance and the that we re, we expanded the number of uh, employees who are getting um, livable wages. Uh, what we are proposing here is that um, that no that that basically, despite the ordinance, uh, the budget would have um, all eligible employees. Uh, sorry, all employees, whether or not they're eligible under the ordinance, um, would would be paid a livable wage going forward. This really um, the main beneficiaries of this are are seasonal workers who have less than five years of experience with the city, um, they would now be eligible um, and they would be paid under, under the proposed budget plan, um, uh, livable wage. And that is an investment of about an estimate of $290,000 on, on an annual basis. Um, we uh, are adding to the budget funds to ensure, uh, to, to try to continue to make progress on having a diverse and inclusive workforce. We have made some progress on this front uh, as a city in recent years. This is to uh, further uh, build into our systems the ability to recruit and retain um, uh, um, BIPOC employees and um, uh, across the city. Um, the next point, Catherine referenced this previously, this is, um, you know, an issue that, that comes down to uh, ensuring that the opportunity to serve and contribute to civic um, efforts is open to as many people as possible. Um, for, I believe, many years, the state has had a policy of compensating board and commission members that serve on state boards and commissions. We have not generally done that with local boards and commissions. This uh, budget proposal would um, add the add funding to allow for a policy change there. Um, the estimate is that it would cost up to $150,000 to at the state um, kind of schedule, the same uh, per meeting schedule that people serving on city boards and commissions uh, would get compensation for, for those meetings. Um, last uh, fall, we approved the city's first ever language access plan this budget has funding for the implementation of that plan. Um, that's an expense of approximately $40,000. Relatedly, um, and in, but in addition, um, this Trusted Community Voices program that we have relied on so heavily during the pandemic to have good two-way communication with our um, immigrant and refugee communities um, would be, uh, the plan is to fund that for another year um, uh, and then eventually um, make that a permanent part of the way the city operates. And um, this, this final bullet references the BPD budget. Um, the BPD budget, of course, there is a lot of innovation and interest in that budget. Um, we did not present on that on Monday. Uh, there will be a presentation on the BPD budget in the, um, in the coming, uh, in, in the next couple of weeks here it is one of those four uh, public um, uh, budget meetings uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, and maybe um, Samantha, you could help me out. You could uh, advise which which night that is. Um, there'll be a focused discussion on the BPD budget. Certainly, though, one thing we know because of the council approval of elements of the public safety continuity plan that um, Chief Murad and I presented uh, early in the year is there will be a significant reallocation of dollars towards CSOs, uh, community service officers and community service liaisons as was agreed with the approval um, of, that, uh, of, uh, of, of that part of the plan. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, great. Um, wanted to just sp spend a moment talking about um, our new and expanded climate action initiatives, some of which um, uh, is sort of within the general fund budget, some of which, a lot of which is within the Burlington Electric Department budget. Uh, we 
when I said at the kind of reminded people at the beginning that last budget year we had to suspend um, virtually all uh, new initiatives, the two exceptions to that were investments in racial equity and justice, as we've discussed, and continuing to make progress on the climate emergency. Um, uh, we did make real progress, as we've talked about in recent um, uh, events. We you know, obviously need to keep making um, dramatic um, uh, change and further improvement if we're going to stay on track with our net zero energy city plan of becoming essentially a zero emissions city with our ground transportation and uh, buildings um, by 2030. And this budget does have the resources to continue that momentum in a number of ways. To hit on just some of the highlights here, uh, the, the BED budget, which is part of the overall municipal budget that will be passed by the end of June, um, uh, has uh, another um, six months of green stimulus incentives. Uh, these are the generous incentives for everything from vehicles to heat pumps to electric lawn mowers and electric leaf blowers. Um, we are continuing those generous incentives uh, in this budget through at least the end of the year. Um, and we are looking, you know, it's another discussion where we're looking to you know, make them permanent eventually through separate action beyond the budget. Uh, that will be in here. Um, that separate action really is this revenue bond proposal um, that will be coming forward this fall um, and which we can probably not the focus more on another time. Um, there is a new electric bucket truck for BED fleet, additional EV charging stations. I'm not sure if we have more bullets on this. There certainly are other elements of our, um, the other elements of the capital budget uh, are uh, really climate related investments in bike lanes, sidewalks um, uh, that, that um, uh, really are necessary to continue the um, uh, transformation, the, the changes in which ways that people get around Burlington, the changes to our transportation system. That is also, uh, as was noted earlier, in the capital budget. All right, are we? Okay, so I think this is the final slide. And what this does is sort of add this all up and show that if all of these initiatives are funded and you know we do expect some change between now and the the uh, passage of a budget and I hope uh, I hope that's clear to everyone uh, you know that we are we are starting the conversation with this with the explicit intent of engaging the council and in the community and I expect there will be changes if um, essentially all of these proposals um, are funded, uh, that would uh, require up to um, $15 um, million uh, of the ARPA funds to be uh, invested in, in, in these areas. The operating budget, the capital budget, um, these immediate reopening and uh, RSC needs, this is the approximately $1 million that I mentioned before will be coming to the council this coming Monday. Um, it, we have about a million dollars to replant proposing to replenish the unassigned fund balance to 15%. And then um, these uh, critical enterprise fund needs approximately $2 million. So with that, um, I think um, uh, Catherine um, or Samantha, there's anything more you wanted to add before we turn this over to uh, questions? Um, I just wanted to answer your question. The Burlington Police Department budget actually as well as REIB and the Church Street Marketplace budgets will all be presented on Wednesday, May 19th. And um, we'll get started on reporter questions. And in the meantime, I will pull up the where folks can find this information on the Burlington City website and uh, let, you, let you all take a look at that before we end the event today. Um, so, a quick reminder that if you would like to get in the queue um, as a member of the media to ask a question, you can email me at sshean at burlingtonvt.org, which is also in the chat. And the first question we had was from Christina at WCAX. Uh, one second, Christina, and I'll enable your microphone.
Okay, Christina, we should be able to hear from you if you want to unmute yourself. Here we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you yes, now. Can. Go ahead, okay, my, my Zoom got very overwhelmed there for a second. No um, so I have a couple of clarifying questions first. So um, and I apologize if this was in one of the slides, but can you break down for me again how much of the budget would be allocated to racial or sorry to um, equity initiatives? Um, so specifically that slide about equity initiatives. So um, are we able to bring that? Um, do, do we have in this uh, PowerPoint a, a slide on that? Or I mean, thank you for something from the, the table. It, it's the, the equity initiatives that we listed just to itemize them for you that this year, the, the, this year's budget, including a significant amount of one-time funds for um, uh, the REIB department is a pro proposed at approximately 1.8 million. Uh, approximately 600,000 of that being one-time um, investments. Then we are proposing um, approximately 100 and, uh, two, sorry, $290,000 to pay all city workers a livable wage, um, $40,000 for the language access plan and the um, transitioning to a policy like the states for compensating uh, board and commission members to expand uh, access and who can serve in those roles is budgeted at $150,000. So I believe those are the main um, uh, new investments uh, that you could put under the umbrella of equity. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, so I did have kind of a totally pivoting question. So I wanted to ask you about uh, the Burlington High School development that we learned last night. So. Um, obviously there's a lot that still needs to be figured out, but there is a concern that there will be a burden on taxpayers um, in the next you know, coming years. Uh, I just first wanted to ask you about learning that now the school is going to have to be abandoned or will uh, likely be abandoned. Um, do we know what will be done with that land? Is the city concerned at all about trying to, you know, find a new location and then take on just a, such a huge project that it is going to cost taxpayers? Just kind of wanted to get your response on that. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Well, you know, I, I'm not surprised because I, of course, have been following, you know, it's this, the, the revelations, um, uh, about the environmental situation at the at the current or at the old high school have been kind of unfolding over the course of the past um, you know better part of a year now and um, so uh, you know I, I did have a sense that we were headed towards the decision the school board made last night am I concerned about it absolutely it's um, this is a, a a crisis for the community that we do not have a um, a permanent high school at this moment um, it's something I you know feel in my uh, family and, and hundreds of Burlington families, um, thousands of Burlington families either currently or uh, have high school kids or are expecting to have high school kids. Um, and it's, you know, you know, it's not a, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a troubling situation that we do not have a permanent high school. Um, I appreciate the decisive action that superintendent Flanagan and the, and the board are taking on this. I mean, it was, it was great work that they got this interim, uh, high school set up in the downtown. And I think I credit them for quickly coming to a conclusion that they needed to change course and abandon the final plan, the old plan and come up with a new one. Um, I had a great meeting this morning with Superintendent Flanagan and many members of the board to talk about where we go from here. And um, I, I think the public can be confident that um, in the coming weeks, there will be a, a uh, a process and a, a timetable released from the district as to how we are going to work through a variety of options and um, come to a decision as a community about a, a new path forward. Um, I also liked what I heard from the district this morning about how they will be um, as resourceful and as creative as possible in securing um, this. It will be expensive to build a new building, 
um, there is work that can be done to, to ensure that that doesn't that that not all of that expense is borne um, by uh, uh, Burlington taxpayers. There are definitely a number of options on the table to um, bring different sources uh, of uh, uh, resources to bear here, um, so that this can can like the the original project remain something that Burlington um, can't afford. Uh, it's going to, I hope people have some patience. It's going to take a little while for that new plan to be put together, but I'm really uh, confident um, that it can be done and that the early steps the district is taking to create that are, um, are the right ones. And I, I have a lot, of, a lot of confidence in Superintendent Flanagan's uh, ability to lead this. Thank you. I had just one last question. Uh, is Taisha not in this meeting today? You know, she, um, she, we had hoped she might be able to be, she had a conflict that so she was not sure she was going to be able to join us. And it appears she, um, uh, that this, uh, she was sort of double scheduled here and she's not with us right now. Okay. Um, then I'll direct my question at you real quick. Um, so now that we're really creating a robust department under this proposal, if it passes, um, what do you see being accomplished in the next year that maybe couldn't have been accomplished in the last because there wasn't necessarily the resources to do so? Yeah, the, the goals, uh, what we're trying to do with the racial equity, inclusion and belonging department are um, major community goals. We, you know, what, I don't think they're all gonna be accomplished in one year or even in, a, in three years, but I do think we'll make progress over the next year towards uh, major critical milestones such as increasing um, uh, BIPOC home ownership, specifically Black home ownership in Burlington, towards um, reducing these terrible racial disparities uh, in health outcomes that we have seen in the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, that you know we've seen they've been particularly bad outside of Vermont. We've worked hard to minimize them. Uh, to, uh, here in Vermont, but we still have seen them in the rates of infection and the rates of hospitalization. Um, that those, what we've seen in COVID is uh, emblematic of a much larger um, problem that um, uh, we have major health disparities uh, by race. This department is set up to, to address that. And certainly I do think in a year, we will have made real progress towards Burlington itself as a city government being um, much more of an anti-racist organization than we are today, much more aware of where we have institutional um, issues that, um, structural issues that um, result in um, biased uh, and, you know, essentially uh, uh, racially disparate outcomes. Uh, we're going to uh, be a, a much more of an organization that seeks those out and, um, and works to root them out once we understand them. And that's what the uh, the training over the next year, we're going to make real progress on that. So those are a few of the big goals. Um, I do look forward to you, you know, talking to Taisha directly about how she would artic articulate um, uh, further goals. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christina. Um, next, I um, am going to call on Pat Bradley from WAMC. Um, Pat, I just enabled you if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, Mayor. How are you today? I'm great, Pat. Good to have you with us. Go oh, ahead. Thanks. Um, I am curious, um, dollar-wise, um, you've outlined some of the individual components of the budget, but I'm wondering what the total proposed city budget uh, for fiscal 22, what the total dollar amount is, and then what percentage the ARPA funds account for that you're you're hoping to use in the fiscal 22 budget. Great. I, um, Catherine, would you like to? Uh, I can answer that if you want me to, but you, you might be, <laughs> provide a more precise answer, Catherine, if you want to. Do it. Of course. Uh, so, as you might imagine, Pat, we are still putting together all of the pieces of all of the budgets, including the enterprise fund. But I believe that um, it gets at the spirit of your question to answer for the general fund. And so the general fund um, in draft budget form is about $82 million. And so, 62. sorry. 62, right? 62, yes. sorry. 
And well, no, those are the operating funds. Oh, you're um, saying, uh, Monroe, yeah. So it is actually 82. Sorry, okay. there's two very confusing numbers here. So it's about 82 million all told. And it's only about 5 million of that is the top line of ARPA that we were talking about. So the 82 million includes the ARPA funds. And if you didn't have it, you'd have to reduce whatever amount of ARPA you're going to end up using, depending on how much you decide to delay use of, correct? Um, yes, I will turn this back over to the mayor in just a moment, but it would um, mean that we would, it would be very difficult to make the investments in racial equity. It would not be possible to return to a full service budget and these things that we have outlined. Um, and also just to be precise, um, as we say, using ARPA dollars, um, how um, precisely that will work uh, as we envision it waiting for the um, exact guidelines is we are eligible to reimburse ourselves for lost revenues from FY20 and 21. Um, and so uh, that's sort of a two-step process of reimbursing ourselves for that and then working with the council to decide how to spend that reimbursed money. Mayor, what would you like to add to that? I think that's good. Okay, and I've got a follow-up question on, on the school um, situation. Um, you mentioned how expensive this is going to end up being, but that kind of triggered a question. You know, all of the improvements that were supposed to go on at the high school had been approved through a bond vote. And, you know, they, they discovered all of these problems with the asbestos and uh, PFAS and all of that stuff in the process of, of moving forward with the project. So could any of the approved bond funds be used as you move forward with a possible new site and new building at all? Or do you have to go back and completely reestablish funding? Um, Pat, the, um, so they, um, first of all, they've spent, um, um, of the, of this 70 million that was approved by voters for a renovated high school plan, um, uh, I believe the, what they have spent out of that is a little more than $3 million. Um, so, it, um, so there, you know, people should understand that the great majority of those funds um, still exist and are, um, you know, are accessible for this project. Um, whether uh, the the bond vote that was made would allow, um, you know, invest whether they would be able to use those without going back to the voters for for one reason or another is something that still needs to be sorted out and that they're starting to work on it. Um, uh, but so that. It, I hope that addresses your question. And is the land itself contaminated? I mean, do we know at this point if the building could just be demolished and you could rebuild on the same land? Yeah, so um, certainly rebuilding a new building at 52 Institute Road, what they call that site, um, the address of that site is is, is an option. Um, what uh, potentially, um, you know, it's a pretty large parcel. There are, uh, th there are a variety of options there. So um, it is certainly um, uh, one of the, one of the possibilities that they are considering is um, a, instead of a renovation project on that site, a new construction project on that site. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Pat. Um, next, we have Liam Elder Connors from VPR. Go ahead, Liam. Hi, um, kind of just following a little bit uh, from what Pat was asking in our first question around the budget. Just wanna make sure that it's, you know, I understand and that everyone understands a little bit. Um, the, the ARPA money 
I mean, there's obviously a lot of different pools of money going around um, in the, the budget proposals that you have some of the, the new things such as, you know, expanding the racial equity office, um, the, you know, livable wage pay, all of those things. Are those all, are the, those are things that are, are going to be permanent parts of the budget and you're not funding with the one-time ARPA money, you're just using the ARPA money to kind of fill up revenue shortfalls. I just want to make sure I'm kind of understanding the, the interplay you have here and like, what proposals are with this one-time money versus things that you're hoping to kind of bring into the fold as, as operational. Right. Um, so um, I, I think I understand your question, Liam, and, and it is a little bit challenging to really not entirely possible us for to, to completely lay out at this point in the budget process exactly, exactly um, what the ARPA funds are going to be used for because we're still awaiting um, uh, definitive rules from the federal government exactly how um, uh, how uh, the funds can be spent. So when we pass a budget, it will be you'll be able to draw a straight line from um, you know, we will we will really lay out it explicitly how what the federal funds are paying for. Um, there is, of course, though, an interrelationship between all of these funds, and we do believe, we, we do know that we have lost vast amounts of money as a city government as a result of COVID, uh, vast revenues since the beginning of uh, uh, the pandemic. And explicitly, one of the reasons that ARPA was passed was to allow municipalities to replace those, those lost revenues. So we... Um, uh, City government is not like, you know, I know there's um, the, the nature of the city's revenues, um, none of the city revenue streams, um, uh, basically all of the major city revenues, well, property, our property tax revenue stream, which accounts for more than a half of city revenues has basically been unchanged by COVID more or less. Most of the other revenues the city gets have been dramatically impacted, whether those are event revenues, gross receipts, um, parks and recs revenues, waterfront revenues um, for events, for uh, the marina, for the campground. Um, uh, all of these um, revenues are very much dependent on economic activity. And so whereas elements of the state budget have seen a dramatic increase in, in revenues as a result of the way COVID has unfolded and sort of the, some of the surprising economic elements of the last year, really the city hasn't experienced any of that. We have lost um, millions of dollars that we will be able to uh, be reimbursed for. So what, um, what is clear right now is that if we wanna have a full service budget and we, um, you know, if we wanna restore uh, pre-pandemic levels of service and make some new investments because our revenues will continue to be down uh, because of the pandemic and, and because our expenses have continued to inflate, um, there will be a significant gap. And when one way or another, we expect to be able to use about $5 million of the ARPA funds to, to fill that gap. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that 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 is helpful. I, I understand there's still um, a lot of moving pieces, and you haven't gotten all the info from the federal government. So I'm sure okay. we'll we'll be hearing more. Um, and and just um, briefly, um, have you started, or do you have a timeline for restarting um, the search for the new police chief? I know it's been delayed about a year. It was about a year ago when you delayed it. Yes, I've been working hard on that, Liam, and and uh, I'll have an announcement about that. Um, uh, before the end of the week. Uh, we have an announcement coming. Um, I'd like, uh, and we are, we are yeah, it will, you'll, you'll, we'll have an update for you on that before the end of the week. Are you starting the search or is it? We'll have news about restarting the search and what the search, um, uh, what, what we're envisioning, how we're envisioning moving forward. But I think we've given you all a lot to communicate, you know, we're trying to communicate a lot to the public today and digest today. That will be a separate amount announcement um, very soon. Great, thanks. Yes, but to be clear, we're not announcing a new, <laughs> a new we're talking about what the what going forward looks like. Thank you. Okay. Um, and next, potentially lastly, we have Grace from VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Grace, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, Mayor, I was just hoping you could kind of just categorize the overall financial health of the city of Burlington as we're exiting this pandemic and as you're planning out this uh, FY22 budget. Well, um, because the Biden administration came forward and finally directly um, uh, assisted um, municipalities with the American uh, Rescue Plan Act, and because Congress, um, you know, because our outstanding federal delegation um, was uh, finally able to overcome the Republican um, obstruction, which was keeping municipalities from being helped, we are now in a very strong financial position. We have gone, because of the passage of that act, we have gone from uh, uh, having a severely constricted budget with the prospect of years of very challenging budgets ahead to one where we are coming forward um, with a full service budget that restores pre-pandemic services that has important new investments in, in equity in it. We're able to do this with, um, uh, with very modest uh, tax impact um, on Burlingtonians and, and also uh, do so in a way that um, would have um, our reserves fully funded. And on top of all that, at least 10 to $15 million of additional resources available to us for um, further important initiatives over the next three years. So we have gone from, I guess maybe to summarize that all, Grace, I think we have gone from by far the most constrained um, uh, economic environment that the city has faced in many decades, probably since the Great Recession. Overnight, we have gone from that to um, uh, having at our, uh, within our control, the most discretionary resources we have ever had. That is why, um, you know, I summarize, I tried to summarize the challenge at the top is, uh, this is uh, um, a, a uh, unprecedented and um, really great opportunity uh, that um, uh, we gives us the the and real responsibility to you know to get all this done is 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 challenging but is you know the, the goals again are um, a full service budget with important new investments and carefully stewarding these un unprecedented resources and making sure that um, you know the best degree we can, every dollar is carefully used and, and invested in a way that has maximum structural impact on the future of this community. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, well, we've kept you here a long time. Um, I, we are, again, um, there is a new landing page on the city webpage that has even more detail on on this budget here's that page um and uh this will is the beginning of a major focus over the next month and a half to get to an fy22 budget we look forward to talking to you all further um about this and uh i think we will call it a, a day uh, at this point thank you all for joining and we will we'll see you all again soon take care everyone